Many of you listening to this are probably a 10 out of 10 in your technical abilities of whatever you do for a living, whether you're in sales, marketing, entrepreneurship, teaching, product management, content creation, whatever it is. But when it comes to your communication ability, maybe you're more like a five out of 10, which means that people are not perceiving you and your brilliance the way they should be. You're leaving so much on the table and it's because you have not mastered the art and skills of communication. And while a 35 minute podcast is not going to elevate you to a 10 out of 10, sorry to break the news, we're hoping that it inspires you to break out of your mold, use your voice in a way that's more engaging and create deeper connections personally and professionally. Today, I'm joined by my friend, my former boss and professor, Dr. James Janak, who is professor of communications at Eckerd College. He's going to help me go from like a five to like an eight today, and he already went helped me go from like zero to five a couple years ago. Welcome to the show, Professor Janak. It's great to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. I'm super excited to see you again. It's been a long time. We have a lot of catching up to do, but let's dive into my first clip I want to show you, and we'll take a look at it together right now. All right. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. <laughs> like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. <laughs> I I'm going to adjust my glasses. <laughs> And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? <laughs> okay, great. I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. <laughs> um, this is basically everything you need to know about public speaking, right? Uh, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, probably not. First, my first question for you is, have you seen this before? I've not seen this before. Okay. Uh, I stumbled across it, okay. and for those that are listening, they're like, what the heck did I just listen to? Um, basically, this is how to sound smart on a TED Talk. And if you've ever listened or watched a TED Talk before, there is certainly a rhythm and cadence uh, and formula that a lot of folks and speakers follow. Um, what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there is there certainly is some truth to it, right? It, I think it emphasizes the importance of the delivery and delivering a message. Yep. It takes practice. It takes thought. It takes intentionality. Uh, the, the part I kind of hate about it mm -hmm. uh, is that I think it helps to perpetuate this this myth or this misunderstanding of rhetoric, right, which is my field. Yes. Right? That's where I have my – my degrees are in rhetoric, which for my purposes means uh, the study of persuasion in the public sphere. But I know it – most people don't understand it to be – that. What they understand it to be is more like Mr. Steven, what Mr. Steven is saying here, right? That it's, you know, seems very polished, fancy language, sounds good, not much substance, sort of empty, right, empty rhetoric. Yes. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, so while he has a point, right, like you have to, you have to deliver a message in a compelling way, you also need to have substance. And I think the best public speaking marries that delivery with that substance. He's very tongue-in-cheek Yes, um, for those that are just listening and didn't get to see this video. I do encourage you to watch the whole thing. I, I think – I'm trying to remember what the ending to it is. We only play like 40 seconds of it. Um, but certainly I think he is nodding and poking fun at for sure. this idea of for sure. being nothing of substance, saying nothing of substance, which unfortunately we see a lot in politics um, and in the public sphere and on social media Right of right. the loudest in the room – gets all the views and likes and attention. For sure. I mean, you know, there's there's a reason why people have this kind of negative opinion of public speaking and rhetoric um, because there are a lot of people out there who are good at it but not necessarily with the best intentions. Yes. Right. So in this episode, we're talking all about how to improve your public speaking skills also, when it comes to phone calls, which is a different dynamic we'll dive into, and as well as Zoom meetings, which is a newer thing that I'm sure you yourself also had to deal with uh, while trying to teach during a pandemic, right. uh, college classes over Zoom. And in the first section, I want to take it way, way back. Okay. So 
Something I miss about being in college is the depth of which we explore topics. Because everything I come across online these days is 12 second TikToks or Instagram reels, and people watch them and suddenly think they are an expert in something. Um, when they have spent very little time diving into the depth of a topic. Um, so let's give the folks a little bit of a history lesson and set the foundation for improving your public speaking skills, your rhetoric, your persuasion. Uh, my first question, what can traditional rhetorical theory from ancient Greece, and for those who are like, what the heck, that's where a lot of this comes from. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but what can they teach us about public speaking for our modern world today? Uh, I still, I would, I would argue that there is still a lot that the uh, ancient Greeks and Romans can teach us. They were really the ones, at least, were largely responsible for the foundation, the Western foundation of the practice and study of public speaking and rhetoric. Uh, and there are a lot of concepts that they thought about, wrote about, developed. I think are still relevant and helpful to people who want to hone their communication skills today, um, right? So the, the, some of the basic concepts like ethos, pathos, and logos, it goes back to Aristotle, uh, you know, which is 2,500 years ago, uh, roughly. Uh, and well, certainly those concepts have evolved, right? As communication practices and technology has evolved, right? They're still really helpful. So ethos, right? Basically, Aristotle says there are three ways uh, that you can uh, try to persuade an audience. And they're not mutually exclusive, right? They all work together. Uh, but basically, you have ethos, which is your credibility, right? So if people trust you, uh, they'll be more likely to listen to you, right? And do and think what you want them to do and think. Uh, there's pathos, which is emotional appeals, right? And we, we know that when someone makes us angry or scared, or, or proud, right? We they can uh, use that to get us to do or think something. Uh, and finally, there's logos, which is rational argument, uh, logical appeals. So making claims, offering evidence to support those claims, and, and you know backing up your statements with uh, with support. And those things are still you know they're still practiced today. They're still useful today. Uh, sometimes they take different forms depending on different medium, right? But that's something that uh, I think anybody who is interested in improving their communication skills should keep in mind, especially if they're looking to persuade people. Is there anyone that comes to mind when you think about the three forms of persuasion that is really good at it? Maybe in like the <laughs> in the public sphere, the first person that I think of is John Stewart. Okay. Um, yeah, I think of him, his new show that he has on HBO, going back to Comedy Central and The Daily Show, what yep. he's been able to do in politics even very recently. Yep, right. Um, he's got a good way of, he's got the credibility. He has a way of getting people emotionally fired up. Yep. And then Logos, which is, in my opinion, one of the ones that's missing most today uh, of backing up his arguments with rationality. So is there anyone that comes to mind for you that you like? Uh, the person who comes to mind first, I think, is maybe Oprah Winfrey. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, brilliant communicator, mm -hmm. uh, very highly respected by a lot of different people across the diverse audience, um, very good at tapping into people's emotions, mm -hmm. right, through her interactions on her shows and, and her entire media empire, right? Uh, and, and again, uh, I think I would agree with you. Right, that logos or rationality is is one that doesn't get as much uh, exposure, right, or as much attention uh, in our mediated worlds these days. Uh, so maybe there's a lot of emphasis on logos, but she, you know, she has experts on her shows. True. Um, so yeah, I think she she melds those approaches to persuasion pretty well. And then the ones that uh, <laughs> just been stir I'm thinking of ones that have also been stirring up some troubles, like Joe Rogan. Right. Um, but I think I want to switch gears and talk about how some of these lessons um, apply to maybe more of like the social media space, yep. website mm -hmm. space, website copy. Right. Um, we'll dive into sales and like your delivery and pitch and, and, and that kind of stuff later in this episode. But how do some of the lessons from the Greeks apply to social media mm -hmm. and website copy? Like you already alluded to, Right. So first of all, there are different expectations about what makes for a good argument and, and what is appropriate argumentation, appropriate logos right, in digital media. Mm -hmm. right. Nobody wants to read 
a 10-page long argument that lays out claims, evidence, cite sources. Nobody's going to do that on social media. My, I'm thinking maybe my brother because he's a lawyer <laughs> and he loves doing that. Yeah. He's like, uh, excuse me, actually, I like doing that. And maybe you do, yes. but very few right. people. Right, I mean, right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so to say nobody, right, it's overstating it, right? But very few people, right? It's not the... Uh, the medium is not. You're right, uh, though. Does not encourage that. Correct. Right, Absolutely. Sure. We're talking about website copy and social media, so you are correct. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, still, right, there is this degree of I think arguments that you have to make. Right. You have to make your claims, and ideally, you'll have some evidence. Right. And and there will be people who will respond to say that you know your arguments are not very sound. Um, potentially, I think um, pathos, you know, has sort of taken up. Filled in that space that Logos has vacated in our digital sphere. The emotional. Right, the emotional, right. And heart, talking at the heartstrings or whatever. Right, getting yeah. people angry, getting people scared, getting people okay. upset, right? Uh, because, yeah. of course, that is, uh, again, the infrastructure of online communication, social media in particular, rewards that approach, right? It gets more likes, it gets more clicks, it gets more shares, right? All of that. Hmm. Um, and then ethos in terms of credibility, ethos has also evolved, right? So ethos is, is, isn't necessarily now about competence and knowledge and experience, right? But we judge people's credibility online by um, how good their social media feed is, right? How, how nice the website is. Does the website look clean, professional, mistake-free? Um, so... These concepts, I think, certainly still do apply, but they apply in, in sort of a different way. Hmm. What is something you think the Greeks got wrong and has changed drastically over time? <laughs> if, they have, if they did get anything wrong. Uh, well, I think the first thing that comes to mind is their ideas of audience, right? So another key concept that we've held on to about communication and public speaking since the ancient Greeks is this idea that you need to tailor your message to a particular audience, mm -hmm. right? So I can't just write a speech and deliver it to 100 different audiences and expect to get the same response from every audience, hmm. right? You have to tailor your message to your particular audience. Um, but, of course, the Greeks had a very limited view of who counted for the audience, Right. In Greece, the only people who were expected to participate in public life, to give speeches, to hear speeches, to make decisions based on speeches, were wealthy, white, not necessarily, well, yeah, white men, mm -hmm. right, landowners. Um, so now we have a much broader understanding of who, who count as audiences, and we have much greater respect for different groups uh, as audience members and participants in the public sphere. Uh, so... Uh, certainly, they they got that wrong. Yes, right. From my view, <laughs> right, um, and like we've already talked about, these ideas of ethos, pathos, logos, these persuasive appeals. Uh, I don't think they got wrong, right? But they certainly have needed to be reconsidered as communication technology has changed. Um, but I think largely, you know, not if you if you adapt to changing technology and changing times and changing expectations of audiences, a lot of these concepts still hold up. There's the canons of rhetoric that say, you know, these are the five things you have to think about when you're giving a speech. You have to think about what you're going to say. You have to think about what order you're going to say your ideas, talk about your ideas. Uh, you, you need to think about style, so what kind of language choices you're going to make when you're communicating. You need to think about delivery, right, which is all the nonverbal components, so it's your tone of voice and your rate of speech and your volume and the hand gestures and the way you're dressed. Um, and then you need to have a way to remember all of this. Uh, and all of these apply to public speaking, but also to web, website copy, uh, podcasting, right? All of this is something that communicators these days still need to, need to think about. I'm like listening to you list those off and I'm like, oh, I need to like this is where practice is so critical, right. and we're going to get into that in this next section about improving your vocal image, but it's so much to think of, and it can feel overwhelming when you're like, oh my gosh, I need to do all of these things to like be a competent or exceptional public speaker and presenter. Um, and before we get into that, I will say that one of the things that's really cool is uh, you and I worked together at Eckerd College's Ray Hall Communications Lab, which is a really cool concept. It's basically a place where college students can go on campus 
Um, they can sign up ahead of time and rehearse their presentations before they have to go give them uh, in class. And basically, so they come in, they practice their speech, and they get feedback from a few of their student peers who work at the center. I was one of those students, and you trained me to work there. Um, I think that that is the best thing you can do. Like that, if, if anyone is just like, I'm going to turn this podcast off right now, I've heard enough about the ancient Greeks, I've heard enough of <laughs> Travis's whiny voice, um, practice. Practice in front of your dog, practice in front of your friends. If you're trying to become a leader or somebody that is selling um, or somebody that is just giving presentations, like that's that's the number one thing. Throw all your tactics out the window, just give it, keep, keep doing it. Repetition, repetition, repetition. That was one of the things that I feel like really resonated and stuck with me over the years from you. Yeah, for sure. I think that's, I mean, that, I, I agree with you. If I'm going to give someone one piece of advice about how to improve is just realize that it doesn't happen overnight, right? And yes, there are some people who may be a little more naturally uh, competent when it comes to communication, but everybody can improve by practicing and it takes practice and you have to do it over and over again in lots of different situations with lots of different people, lots of different audiences. Uh, and this is what our consultants to this day are still telling the students who come into the center on campus, as I'm, you know, the best thing you've done to prepare for this presentation is to show up here yeah. to practice. This just by showing up, yeah, was like half the battle right. in a lot of ways because you'll be just even if it's ten percent better than you're going to be when you actually have to give this in front of people, right? And you'll be thinking about this whole experience, yeah, and be like, oh shoot, okay, and this won't <laughs> be the first time you've done it because that's where a lot of people go wrong is they just try to wing it. Yes. They come into podcasting studios with me sometimes and they try to wing it. And you can tell those episodes don't always go so great. Um, maybe they're wild and off the charts, but there's not a lot of <laughs> educational value for them. Um, okay. <laughs> Section two, segment two of this podcast, improving your vocal image. I want to play a clip from a keynote speaker and public speaking uh, expert, Vin Jang. Via the way I speak, people are making assumptions about my level of education, they make assumptions about my level of success, they make assumptions about how trustworthy I am. All of that is communicated via the vocal image. People make assumptions when they look at you, but the moment you open your mouth, they solidify their assumptions about you. First of all, I really like this guy, Vin Jang. He is, um, whenever he pops up on my TikTok feed or I come, I'm like entranced by him. He's come such a long way. Um, we were look, you and I were looking at his website earlier and we're like, wow, did you see like the before videos? Um, so if you would, I think he gave a decent description of vocal image, but is this a real thing? How important is it? And what is it if, if you had to understand it? Uh, well, I should say that, uh, it's the first time I've heard this term, but it is, it is a, a term, right? And it's real, it's important. Uh, and it is essentially what, um, he's saying, and that is that, Vocal image is the impression that people get of you based on the sound of your voice. Uh, I would probably, and uh, you know, this this may frustrate you. This is what you get when you have professors on your show, yeah. right? But of course, I'd probably uh, tweak what he said a little bit. I wouldn't. I would say it doesn't necessarily solidify one's assumptions, right? But it can. It can also disrupt people's assumptions, right? If the if what you say doesn't necessarily match people's visual or preconceived conception of you. Uh, so there's there's been research that sh has shown that variety of speaking, uh, if you speak a little bit faster than average, if you have fewer vocalized pauses, things like um, like, you know, uh, if you speak a little bit louder, you are perceived as more confident, more intelligent. Uh, and again, doesn't necessarily mean that you are. <laughs> Right. You're just perceived. That's right. So. You're perceived that way. <laughs> um, and it also, maybe you do have lots of vocalized pauses or you take time to say what you want to say. It doesn't mean you're not intelligent either, right? But it is, like you said, you can be expert in your field, right? But unless you can communicate it in a way that shows people or suggests to people that you're expert in your field, a lot of that advantage is going to be lost in an interaction. I see this a lot um, in my world of being in marketing, um, you have folks who are unbelievably good at what they do, at drumming up new business through advertisements and digital media. And when they get in a meeting, 
they have a really hard time articulating their ideas. They have difficulty in keeping people's attention. And they throw a slide up on the television or the, you know, the, the Zoom call, and everyone falls asleep. And then people don't look forward to having meetings run by that person anymore, and they dread them. And that's where the perception really becomes a problem. And I think if someone <laughs> could improve their vocal image, they <laughs> wouldn't be leaving their brilliance on the table like we talked about. Um, even going from a 5 to a 7 out of 10 on this fake scale I've created <laughs> of right. capturing and holding that attention. Yep. It goes so much farther in your own career, your own respect, how people engage with you. It usually can just make your life a lot easier, in my experience. So what are some of the tactics? We were talking about Ray Hall that folks can do to improve their vocal image. You mentioned rate of speech. Yes. Right. Um, it, what about hand movements, does that play into vocal image or body language? Or yeah. I, I think for sure it does. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's no, you know, the, the funny thing about communication, about rhetoric, about public speaking is there are no hard and fast rules, right? So going back to what I said before about what Aristotle was saying that, you know, you have to adapt your message to a particular audience. So uh, there have been attempts to say, okay, what kind of gestures make for the most effective gestures? But you really, you really can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because audiences are different, situations are different, uh, topics are different, all of that's different. But it is something that you need to think about in every situation. Hmm. Right? So sometimes you're going to want to be more expressive with your hands. Uh, sometimes, of, almost always, you're going to want to make eye contact right, with your audience. So all of these subtle things, and I think we're going to watch a clip a little bit later mm -hmm. uh, where um, Mr. Jang is actually coaching some of his... Yes. Um, associates and he makes some adjustments sort of on the fly and you see that they're actually very subtle like the changes in delivery are actually quite subtle but they make a huge difference in the way we're perceiving people and it's hard to, we're talking about it but when we get to it and we show it you'll be like ah and even for the folks that are just listening to this in their car or something you can hear the difference in the delivery yes and are the best speakers the ones that are the best adapter like adapters would you say so I think about myself, and I have many different audiences. Um, I have my family, I have my coworkers, I have my friends that listen to the show, and I speak to them. I tr sometimes I approach them all the same way, mm -hmm. and I qu really quickly learn uh, by observing their response to me that they have sometimes no clue what I'm talking about. I'm thinking of my family, and they're like, what is this guy talking right? about? And so I do have to slow down my rate of speech. I have to even change the, the diction, the vocabulary, the word choice of what I'm saying. Um, and sometimes I'll just choose altogether to not share certain stories because I'm like, it's just not the right audience. Right. So, yeah, are, are the best public speakers the ones that are the best adapters? Yeah, or? I think often. Yeah. Right? I think there is probably a pretty strong correlation between our ability to observe situations, right, and recognize people's reactions and the, the factors in different settings uh, and our ability to then translate that into uh, creating a message right that's going to be effective in that based on those observations hmm. uh, so I think there is a lot of it is about yes adapting to your situation um, you know what you're saying a lot of us I mean we're all right performing our identity right uh, and that performance is an act of communication. Hmm. Uh, so we're going to be adapting that performance for different audiences. So we're going to act differently with our parents than we are with our friends, right, with our coworkers. Um, and uh, we do that all the time and don't, you know, we don't necessarily find that to be problematic. Um, so if you, if you just extend that concept, right, to say a public speaking situation, right, and think that, okay, I need to think about who I'm talking to, why I'm talking to them, where I'm talking to them. It, I really think it can help you become a better communicator. I love that. Is there anything else besides vocal image that you see people make mistakes most often mm -hmm. when it comes to public speaking? Well, I think um, it's related to vocal image, right? I think uh, particularly with undergraduates who who I work with a lot and 
mostly here. It is this uh, vocal delivery, this idea that we convey our interest and enthusiasm and energy through our vocal delivery. <clears throat> Public speaking is stressful. It's difficult. A lot of people don't like it. Uh, but when you're public speaking, you don't want people to think you don't like it and don't want to be doing it, right? So <laughs> the way you do that, right, is use vocal variety. You change your rate, change your tone, change your volume, right? You are expressive with your hands, right? You might move around a little bit, right? You, you demonstrate some energy. Uh, so often with novice speakers, novice communicators, it's it's too clear sometimes to the audience, right, that they are just want to get through it, right? It's just a task for them that they mm. just need to get through. Okay, that's, um, yeah. And, 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 right, are not speaking with sincere conviction about their topic. And I would say with maybe folks who are a bit more seasoned, it might be the opposite. They just want to hear themselves speak, <laughs> and they don't shut the hell up. That's, that's <laughs> right. That's right. They just keep going on and on. Yes. As my wife likes to tell me that I go on and on. Um, but I do think there's something there uh, for for my listeners to think about, which is this vocal variety and showing your audience that you really do want to be there yeah. is such is such a big part of this equation right. that people that have figured it out excel in and people that haven't quite mastered that. Like, people can feel your vibe, bra. Like <laughs> That's right. Yep. That's right. Like if your vibe is that you don't want to be speaking right now, yep. whoo, you're not gonna sell very much, tell you what. That's right. And <laughs> even if you, you know, even if you really do want to be speaking and you're really invested in what you're speaking about, uh -huh. right, that doesn't necessarily translate without a little help through your vocalics, right? And through your your rhetorical choices. Yeah. So in our last section, I have a few um, clips here that I want to pull up. One is a recording from Nikhil over at Nooks. And basically, some of the folks over at Nooks shared this with me. And this is a cold sales call. So there's this is where vocal image becomes really important, right? We don't have any video. We can right. only hear someone on the phone we don't know what they look like. We're making judgments about them really quickly. Um, just like Vin said of like, we're making judgments about where in the world they're from, what their gender is, yeah. how much they're worth, what they're trying to get from us or give us. Like there's so many perceptions that happen very quickly. Right. Um, let's listen to the first one. And then I just am curious to hear what your feedback is for Nikhil and how you think the call is going and, and maybe what our listeners can can take away and learn from in their own efforts. Because a lot of the folks listening to this are like, they're cold calling all the time um, and they have to deal with this. And um, maybe there's observations you have that they themselves are missing that may make them more successful. All right, let's all roll right, the clip. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll listen to it now. Hi, Kyle. This is Nikhil from Nux. How are you? Is this a good time to talk now? From who? From where? Um, from Nux. So I'm the reason I'm calling you is I'm following up on an email I sent. Uh, does the name Nux ring a bell? It doesn't. Got it. Uh, okay. So um, Nux is a Stanford startup uh, I'm co-founding that's building virtual sales force for remote SDR teams at companies like Gong and Luma Health. Do you manage a team of remote SDRs? I do. Great. Yeah. So the idea behind Nux is pretty simple. It's that you know, when your sales team was in person, your reps could get off their calls and when they do cold calls like I'm doing now and immediately celebrate their wins and give each other feedback. But when they're remote, they'll put down the phone and they basically just sit alone in their room. So Nix is trying to fix this idea of, and bring back the energy and team collaboration of the physical sales floor. Are these things, you know, energy, team collaboration, are these things a priority for your team this year? It is, but I don't really understand the the problem. You're, like, is the problem you're trying to solve? Yeah. So this one, I don't think it went that well. Um, <laughs> I try to remember what the rest of the clip ended up happening. I actually think that the guy was pretty receptive and ended up oh, wanting to listen because okay. it goes on for like another three or four minutes. If I think if it didn't go well, the person guy would have been like, "Hey, man, like, get right, lost." Would have ended yeah, yeah much faster probably. Yeah. So thoughts, observations. What did you notice? Uh, well, first, you know, I should say. Uh, 
I feel bad about harshing on Nikhil, right? Because this is a really, I mean, it's difficult. It's hard. Job. It's really hard. It is. Right. It's one of the most difficult communication situations right, that we that we have yeah. that we encounter. You're interrupting and bothering someone. Right. And asking them for something. Exactly. And I they mean, don't want you. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it's just tough. It's a really tough audience. It's a tough situation. It's really hard. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are, I think, a few things maybe that could, that could help this go better. Um, so... Uh, the caller, I guess not the caller, the recipient of the call. Um, you know, he wasn't he wasn't clear. Like, what is this? Like, what is this about? Like, I don't really understand what this is. Right? So, I mean, one of the things that that is sort of a common way to create a, a, a more conducive environment for persuasion is to create a need and then offer satisfaction to that need. All right. So, I think maybe this is one thing that Nikhil could do better because. Uh, the person he was calling didn't really understand like, what problem he was trying to solve, what service was supposed to do. Right? So if he could be a little more um, intentional right, or mindful about setting up and organizing that, that cold call so that he presents the problem that ideally you know, the person he's calling would have and then offering a solution to that right, and be clear about that, it might go a little bit better for him. Right? Um, I think he probably could also know his material a little bit better. Uh, my impression was he was working from a script. It felt like it. Right? You could hear the reading of it. Yep. Right? Uh, which is fine, right? But you don't want to sound like you're reading from a script. Yes. It's why if I was just reading for 30 minutes of this podcast, people would fall asleep. Right. Unless I was a genius or something. <laughs> right. I, like yeah. some people can do it. Like sometimes <laughs> it's great, right? But uh, – but yeah, it's a lot more challenging than uh, right than we think. Having that casual um, vocal image or that casual tone uh, is huge. So I I love that tip of like know your material better. Yep, right. Yeah, and sound enthusiastic about it, right? And it's a lot easier to do that when you're not reading it than it is when you are just reading it. Yeah. Right, because I mean, he's the, he's a founder of the startup. Like, yeah. I bet he is super proud of what he's done, and he knows everything about it. Right, but you don't get that sense of enthusiasm when he's sticking to his script like that. Agreed. I'm also thinking too. Another tactic I've heard for folks to help with like the confusion is they go, "Hey, Doctor Janak, this is a cold call. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm trying to sell you something. Do you want to hang up now, or do you want to give me 30 seconds?" So a lot of folks call that like a pattern interrupt. Uh -huh. They use it as a way to stand out a bit. Yep. It's starting to become really commonly used, so it's uh -huh. not as much of a pattern interrupt. But it does set the stage and the environment of what this is. Right. Um, and I'm trying to remember that for the first thing that you said was, um, I, th I think it was like trying to help with that confusion. Yes. Because right. the guy was like, what is, what is happening right now? Right. Who are you? <laughs> but I will also say this. It amazes me when people pick up the phone of an unknown number and are confused. Fair. <laughs> Very fair. Like, right. Why are you confused, man? <laughs> right. right. I only pick up unknown numbers usually if it's local or I have the time to listen and talk to somebody. If yeah. I don't, it goes to voicemail. And then if I get a text message and an email following up and it seems of interest, I'll check it out. Anyway, that's aside from the point. Yeah. Um, you know, which is an even larger challenge for people who are tasked with making cold calls. Yes. It's like it's just hard to get somebody to listen to you. Yeah. And so when right? you, I think though, when you, you're right though, like um, showing that excitement from the get go, I mean, he's the co-founder. Right. There should be a little more enthusiasm to his voice. Um, this is something I give tips for when people get on camera too. Like if I'm working with people at my company who are explaining something and they're doing an explainer style video and they're working with like a, you know, a camera crew like we are right now, I'll say, you need to amp it up 15%. Yep. And they're like, what do you mean? And I go, L you know how they say the camera adds 10 pounds? Well, it also like can detract like 10% enthusiasm from you. So you have to dial it up a bit more in order for folks to be in, like engaged enough when they click play on your video or else they're going to they're just going to keep scrolling. It's right, it's absolutely right. Um, you know, you it's not enough to be enthusiastic, right? You have to convey that enthusiasm. Hmm. Uh, and I don't know, like if you've ever seen like, movies, TV shows, there'll be like a, a morning news show and the scene will be just before the morning news show starts. It's kind of behind the scenes, right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the hosts are always sitting there saying, okay, energy, energy. It's like the last <laughs> thing they say before the camera rolls, right? <laughs> and there's, you know, there's something to it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of the, the guy from 
oh my god what was the stupid movie wolf of wall street with matthew mcconaughey and these <laughs> yep right <laughs> to try to like get himself pumped up. Yep. Um, All right. I have one last video. Let's go ahead and watch Vin's video here. So this last one is from Vin's website where he shows the before and after from students who have taken his course. Let's take a look. We'll pull it apart uh, a bit and see what our listeners can learn from this and what advice you have, Dr. Janak. All right. Check this out. I was walking into a meeting, a one-on-one with Pat, a new member of our team. What was the most amazing part about that was the freedom that I felt when I told them. And I'm really excited about that, um, getting clarity around what my message is. Um, Thank you in advance for your feedback. I see the, the bigger version of me. So Vin, thank you so much. So especially that second clip of the woman. Yes. Where she was, the original before she got some of the improvements, that's what almost every Zoom call is like <laughs> for most people. That's right. There's a lot of those vocal pauses and ums that you talked about to try to eliminate, and it's agonizing. <laughs> but when you have someone like the second version of her improvement video, that's somebody that I'm like, let's go to this meeting. That's like, right. Can we right. go to a happy hour too? Because <laughs> this is going to be fun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, you know, there's not, again, it's relatively subtle. Yeah. What are some of those subtleties you noticed? Yeah. So the change in tone, right, the in- increase in volume, the eye contact, you know, like all these things just to just to vary how you're saying things. Yes. Instead of using a monotone, right, instead of trying to get through it, mm-hmm. right, actually embrace it as something that you want to do or at least suggest that you want to do. Uh, and I think... On like Zoom, it's 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 that much tougher, right? Because we are are watching and listening to someone through a screen. Yeah. And the people who we usually watch and listen to on screens, right, are professional actors, right? Who have rehearsed, who have directors, yep. right? Who have all the so so it's very, very polished. It's, it's not necessarily realistic, but it's very polished. And this is what we have grown accustomed to. When we see someone on screen, we expect it to be really good communication. Yep. And of course, most of us are not professional communicators. So communicating to a screen really accentuates the difference between acting and and the communication we're used to hearing by a screen and Zoom meetings. There was, um, just watching those improvements, I think back to what we were talking about earlier. It's like, it's practice. It's these little subtle things. And where I think people get afraid is they're like, I don't want to be too over the top. Trust me, you (laughs) most likely, unless you're like a small percentage of the population, you're not going to be over the top. People aren't, they're not in, they're not perceiving you the same way you perceive yourself. And that's why watching and listening to recordings of yourself, I had a guest on here who was like, I hate listening to myself. And I was like, I got over that so quickly. And I got over it working at Ray Hall with you um, because you had to watch and listen to yourself. And you learn so much from doing that that you won't do otherwise. So that's my other tip is like watch and listen to recordings of yourself. Please do it all the time. You will notice so many things. Um, Yeah, I think when I teach my public speaking class, uh, I have students do that and they record themselves and then they have to watch it and, and uh, offer some feedback to themselves, right? S- some evaluation of themselves. And they they hate it. Hate it? They hate it. Oh, the novice speakers. They're right. like, Ugh. But I think it's really probably the most useful thing that I ask them to do. Yes. Right, is, is to watch themselves. And I think, um, I mean, that's part of it. And I would also say, you know, get others to watch you People who you trust, yeah, right. Who are knowledgeable, who will be honest with you, but also kind with you, yes, right. And get feedback, like we try to do at the Ray Hall Center at Eckerd College, right. Is have people who will listen to you and be able to give you some some helpful input. Yeah, it, you really, if you try to dial it up and you're listening to some of the tips that Dr. Janak is giving here of vocal variety, um, increased rate of speech, your tone, and you're like, well, I don't want to be so extra again. You're probably not going to be. Probably not. Like, right. Really trust that you won't be. Um, and it's going to take some practice too, and it might take a little bit of a shift. And you can turn it on and off, I think, like a spigot. Like when you get on a sales call, just like you said, the morning news guys, 
Woo, got to pump yourself up. Let's go. Let's bring the energy. You don't have to talk like that to your wife. Or your family, or whatever. Right, and you would want time. to, right? Right. It's exhaust. That would be exhausting. Exactly. <laughs> like different communication <laughs> contexts, like different communication. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, cool. This has been such a delight. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Janak, for coming in and helping us with our public speaking. I've been very conscious this whole time of like all of my movements and stuff, and much more uh, just paying attention to it. Well, when this is posted, I'm going to go back and count all the vocalized pauses that we both had. <sighs> They make software now that removes it. Excellent. And Love it. I am not a fan of it because it feels, so, I'm like, wait, this feels like robotic in a way. Um, but anyway, everyone, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Janak, for coming in. And um, we'll have another episode in a couple of weeks for you. So thanks. Thanks, Travis. Thanks for listening to the Customer Engagement Lab brought to you by PandaDoc. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or connect with us on LinkedIn. We love to hear from you and what you think of the show.